Hi folks, let's make a set of knife handles out of this G10 material. Welcome to another Wednesday widget. We need to cut this piece down to four inches by two inches, and I don't want to use one of our shop band saws because this stuff is nasty and it's effectively glass. It's, I don't want to doll up one of our expensive good bandsaw blades. So we marked out our pattern using a scrap set of one, two, three blocks. It's actually from when we did the Okamoto grinder five block test. So these are just scrap blocks. Let's just set up a quick bushing or guide for this hand hacksaw and shout out to Tom Lipton. It's been a great idea. Keep a hacksaw blade around the shop. Super useful for cutting off little pieces or in this case, uh, I don't wanna again use a really good bandsaw blade on this glass G10 type material. You've gotta clean up too. You've gotta wear a respirator. This stuff is nasty and you do not want to breathe it. When I hacksaw it, all I really care about is keeping those two edges parallel enough that it will securely hold in the vise when we go to do op one. And it worked great. The tool to do this is pretty cool. It is tool number 46099 from the folks over at Tools Today. Shout out, they did send this tool to us. And it is a carbide tool specifically meant to cut G10 and fiberglass and other composites. Gnarly looking tool, right? You've got to be safe. Like I said, absolutely need to wear a respirator. You do not want to breathe this stuff in. And instead of facing the material down, I am using an adaptive to remove that excess material height. So let's talk speeds and feeds. First off, shout out to Sam over at Venom Defense and Design. He helped us out with some recipes because he machines a lot of carbon fiber and other composites. His recommendation was 500 service feet per minute. And he actually recommended 2% of your tool diameter as your feed per tooth. So 0.25 inch tool times 2% is five thousandths of an inch per flute. I didn't know how to think about this tool in terms of the numbers of flutes, but that recipe came out to about 7,700 RPMs at 77 inches a minute. And I thought, let's start there, see how that runs, and it worked great. You can pretty much bury, in his words, uh, or take pretty big depths of cut and widths of cut. So we've got a 0.2 inch optimal load or width of cut and a quarter inch depth of cut. Tool's running great. It is a mess though. I was just trying to use the shop vac to avoid too much of it going out into the general machine area. You also don't want this stuff on your machine ways or gibs. If I did more of it, I would build a box enclosure, create an airflow draft to really better contain and evacuate this stuff. All that's left now for op one is to use a 2D adaptive to adaptive out and then contour out these four screw holes. Max RPMs for me here was about 300 surface feet or 9,200 RPMs, four thou per tooth, 0.0625 optimal load. This is pretty easy cutting. The goal here is to finish those holes so that we can then use them with these McMaster car low profile socket head cap screws. So these guys are perfect because they would fit inside of that and that's gonna allow us to run our OP2 fixture. So for OP2, that's the key. How do we hold these? We've machined this fixture with some 632 tapped holes in the correct location and this does two things. Uh, not only does it hold the parts, but our XYZ zero is on the back left corner of that. So we actually use the Heimer and we find that point first. Then we put our piece of raw material down. Let's rock and roll. 
similar adaptive with that same tools today tool, same speeds and feeds of recipe. Again, making a mess wasn't quite so bad when we moved to the smaller tools here to do some of the surfacing. Again, what you want to look for is delamination. This stuff is a laminate, meaning it's just multiple, if not hundreds of layers of material that's adhered together. So when we cut it, we want it to not delaminate. And this did a great job. I think right when we poke through the end of this adaptive slot here, you'll see a little bit of tearing, but it didn't hurt anything whatsoever. And I actually was really happy with how the machine turned out. I gotta give a shout out to Pathpilot. It is awesome how it is able to parse through this G-code. It's just amazing. If you ever have problems with that, one thing that's worth noting is smoothing. So if you go into your Edit Your Adaptive, Passes tab, what is this smoothing thing? Let's take a quick look. If I simulate this adaptive, I'm gonna turn off the stock, I'm gonna change my mode to tailpath for operation, and I've got show points checked. Take a look at how many black points we have. Each black point or dot is a line of G-code. I duplicated that same operation, but I added smoothing, which is really arc filtering, if you've heard of that term before. And I put it at two thousandths of an inch, which is double the tolerance. Now take a look at the number of black points. Very few. The other way to see this is look at the size of the code. Without smoothing on, this is 188 kilobytes. With it on, it's 47 kilobytes, about a quarter of the size. So this is important for two reasons. If you have an older machine, it's not gonna be able to handle large file sizes. The other thing is if your machine isn't able to handle the speed of the code, the look ahead, the speed at which it has to process it, smoothing is your friend. We're also using this tool to rough out the 3D surfacing shape to leave as little material as we have to when we switch over to a 1 8 inch ball end fill. Finishing it up with our 3D surfacing of this radius or fillet, we're using a 1 8 inch ball end mill. My understanding with sort of regular carbide tooling on these composites or G10 is you're, you're gonna dull that tool almost instantly to a certain point but then it's going to function for some period of time before it dulls further to a point where it doesn't work. So again, we're looking for delamination. Uh, this ran great though. Where we did spend a lot of time is on these morphed spiral settings. Let me know in the comments below. We could do a video on this whole setup. Uh, here you can take a quick look. We did select the inside and outside edges as the boundary selection. We've got slope checked and we've got avoid touch surfaces to avoid that tool path from going inside our screw holes. We also spent some time adjusting the settings under the passes tab, as you can see here, to make sure that the, the tool path, for the most part, machined what I call bottom up. In other words, starting lower down and working its way up means that it's gonna cut more with the side of the tool where you've got better surface footage and chip evacuation rather than with the very center tip of the tool. Super happy with how it turned out. I mean, it's totally different than machining uh, a steel or an aluminum. Let's take a closer look and see if we can get them even looking a hair better. Uh, we had a slight burr on the back side, so we used the Noga ceramic uh, deburring tool. It works great on plastic. It worked okay here. Uh, we also ended up switching to some 400 grit sandpaper, which again, shout out to Sam at Vanham Defense and Design. Uh, he said sandpaper, a little soap and water, and then get this, you can use some linseed oil to help kind of give them a little shine up. I didn't have any on hand, so three in one oil it is, but it worked great. Uh, to me, they, they looked good. I was really happy with how they machined. Didn't look exactly like what I would think of as a finished knife handle product. So maybe I'm still missing something in terms of sort of the G10 standard uh, processes in terms of what the finished product is. It's that really that top surface that kind of looked like a honeycomb. Nevertheless, really happy with how the tool performed. Happy with how the cam and the fixturing worked. Hope you guys enjoyed. Hope you learned something. Take care. See you next Wednesday.